My name is Ronnie Green, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Welcome to Hardin Hall and to our campus here at UNL. Uh, the School of Natural Resources, many of you will know, is housed in this building, so welcome to our campus. We're very pleased this afternoon in our continuing Hearman Lecture Series uh, to welcome Dr. Pamela Ronald and Raul Adamchuk from the University of California, Davis. You'll, you'll know that the Hearman Lectures is now in its second year. We've been very, very pleased with the attention that this lecture series has generated both on and off campus, bringing international authorities to our campus in the areas of food security, water security, natural resource security, and the overall food system around the world. It's it due to the generosity of Keith and Norma Hearman and I believe, if I'm correct, this is the first one of the lectures in the two years that we have had them that they were unable to attend. They're actually out of town today and uh, would be here otherwise. But Keith and Norma are from Phillips, Nebraska, between Aurora and Grand Island, Nebraska, longtime agriculturalists in the state, and were generous with their gift to endow this lecture series to allow us to have these folks come to our campus. The lecture series is available on Campus Channel 4 and on Lancaster uh, County Channel number 21. And it also is uh, web streamed live. So in addition to our audience here on campus, we have others joining us from across the campus community and across the state and the region. We also archive all of these lectures. So if you haven't been able to participate with us uh, in the previous lectures that have been in the series, I do welcome you to go to the website at hearmanlectures.unl.edu to be able to tap in and hear those previous speakers. Today we're very, very pleased to welcome a husband and wife team. So this is a little different kind of lecture format for us. I was asking them at lunch, how are you going to do this? How you, what's your format that you're going to use to present? So I'm looking forward to their creativity in that regard as well. They are the co-authors of a book entitled Tomorrow's Table, Organic Farming, Genetics, and the Future of Food, which is also their topic for this afternoon's lecture. Let me first introduce Dr. Pamela Ronald. She's a professor in the Department of Plant Pathology and the Genome Center of the University of California at Davis and serves as the Director of Grass Genetics at the Joint Bioenergy Institute. Her lab has genetically engineered rice for resistance to diseases as well as tolerance to flooding. She and her colleagues received the U.S. Department of Agriculture's 2008 National Research Initiative Discovery Award for their work on flood tolerant rice. In 2012, she was awarded the Louis Malassis International Scientific Prize for Agriculture and Food and the Tech Award for Innovative Use of Technology to Benefit Humanity. Her research has been published in Science, Nature, and other leading peer-reviewed scientific journals and has been featured in such publications as the New York Times, Forbes, and the Wall Street Journal, along with others. She is married to, and her co-presenter today, is Raul Adamchuk, who is the Market Garden Coordinator in the Agricultural Sustainability Institute, also at UC Davis, where he teaches organic agriculture and manages the UC Davis student farm. He was telling us about that at lunch today, and I know you will, you will be intrigued by his comments. He's farmed organically for 25 years, Worked for eight years as an organic farm inspector for the Cal California Certified Organic Growers. Has served as president, in fact, of that growers board. He's also been a member of the board of the Organic Farming Research Foundation. So I think, Pamela, you're going to start. Is that right? So please join me in welcoming Pamela Ronald and Raul Adamchak. <laughs> Thank you, 
Ronnie. <laughs> well, thank you, Ronnie, and your team for inviting us today. It's really a great honor, and we're uh, th also grateful to Norma and Keith Herman for their generous, generous support of their lecture series. I understand it's been a very successful lecture series. And um, thanks also to Judy Nelson for her tremendous arrangements of our visit. So as you know, Raul is an organic farmer and I'm a geneticist. And you may even think that geneticists and organic farmers don't even speak to each other because we represent supposedly polar opposites of an agricultural spectrum. But we do have conversations and it's not difficult because we have the same goal which is an ecologically based system of agriculture. Still, over the years, many of our friends, families, and colleagues have asked us how genetic engineering will affect uh, the health of the environment and our food. And they've also asked us if, if organic farming can provide enough food to feed the world. So we, really, we wrote this book in response to those questions. And our intention was to give uh, the reader a better understanding of what geneticists a actually do, as well as farmers, and to help re readers distinguish between fact and fiction in the debate about crop genetic engineering. So the way we set this up is, uh, first Rebel will start off the talk uh, discussing the state of agriculture today. Many of you have probably uh, noticed that uh, sustainable agriculture is in the news a lot, uh, often in the form of a debate <coughs> between uh, organic farming and conventional farming and genetic engineering. But it really is uh, one of the important issues of our time. A after many years of human beings farming with really limited knowledge of both plants and ecology, we now have an understanding of how agriculture affects the environment. We have knowledge of, at the molecular level of how plants work. And we have a wide range of tools that, will, that should allow us to make significant improvements to agriculture. And, and that's a good thing. It's a good thing because when we look at the kind of agriculture we have today, it varies throughout the world. Some areas of the world, the U.S. is very productive. Parts of Africa are extremely unproductive. And there's a whole range of countries in between. Uh, some of them can feed themselves and some, uh, some can't. But there are some traditional issues in agriculture that people have been working on for a long time and they haven't been resolved. And if we want to have a sustainable agriculture, we need to resolve these issues. Um, one of them, of course, is the use of pesticides. And pesticides impact the environment and natural enemies as well as people as well. Um, soluble fertilizers um, solu that come off of uh, farmland, contaminate groundwater, contaminate surface water, cause problems around the world. And also soil erosion which we've been battling in the U.S. for many years. Uh, and we've had improvements here, but it's, a, but, but it's still a problem here, and it's also a problem throughout the world. I'm just going to give you uh, a, a brief, a couple of brief slides about each of those issues, just to give you some perspective about the situation. This is a, a slide of pesticide, annual pesticide use in the U.S. from 1988 to 2007. And despite many efforts to reduce pesticide use, the declines really haven't been that significant over the past 20 years. There have been reductions in, in, in toxicity and certainly improvements in safety, but there's still a lot more work to do. And what always um, astounds me is that, like in California in the last 10 years, we've lost 400,000 acres to housing developments. And if you look at pesticide use in California, you don't really even see the impact of that. So it's a, uh, uh, although, <laughs> although this is an issue that uh, um, 
activists are not pushing hard on these days, it's a problem that hasn't gone away. This is a slide of the Gulf of Mexico, and on the left part of the slide is a dead zone that's caused by uh, the runoff of fertilizers uh, from the Midwest, nitrogen and phosphate mostly, and it, uh, algae grow, microbes break the algae down, they use oxygen in the water, they take all the oxygen out of the water and basically nothing can live. Uh, this is only one of 200 major sites of what's called eutrophication in the U.S. and maybe one of 2,000 around the world. Uh, because uh, interestingly enough, you know, I think of the U.S. as being the biggest user of, uh, of synthetic, uh, synthetic fertilizers, but if you look at China's use and India's use, you would be, you'd be amazed how much more is being used there. Uh, and they have similar, similar kinds of problems. So here a 6,500 square mile dead zone forms every summer at the mouth of the Mississippi River. The third problem is soil erosion. This is a, a farm field in Iowa in the spring before planting, intensive rain, the soil's not covered, and a lot of soil goes off into the rivers, but if there was fertilizer or there were pesticide residues on the ground, all of that would go into the rivers too. And I don't want to pick on Iowa, soil erosion happens everywhere, and as a result, and, and, um, this, is a, this is a map of uh, soil erosion around the world, and the, the red zones are the areas where there are very degraded soils. But according to the UN, 30% of the world's arable land has become unproductive or at least less productive due to soil erosion. And the US and other countries are still losing soil faster than they're replenishing soil. And it's estimated that $400 billion a year is lost due, due to uh, soil erosion around the world. Those would be problems enough, and I think we could, we could really make some progress on those problems, but overlaying that, demographers estimate that the world's population is gonna increase by three billion people in the next 40 or 50 years. And so not only do we have to feed our existing population, which is already undernourished, a billion people undernourished, but we have to feed another three billion people and we need the food to, need the food to do that. And to make that even more challenging, there's one layer on top of another here, uh, we have climate change, we have global warming. Uh, this is a, a slide of drought in Africa, but there are gonna be increased incidents of drought all over the world, as well as, depending on where you live, increased incidents of flooding. This is Bangladesh, which is downstream from the Himalayas, and when it, snows or the, and the, the glaciers melt and the snow melts up there, you get flooding in all of uh, South Asia. And this is a, uh, a slide here of a rice field that's been flooded uh, and the crop lost. So Pam and I believe that the discussion about agriculture must be framed in the context of environmental, economic, and, and social impacts of agriculture sort of the, these, these are the three pillars of uh, sustainable agriculture. And what's important, uh, what's most important is determining the things that enhance local food security and, and, and provide safe, abundant, nutritious food to uh, consumers. You have to ask, we have to ask if rural communities can thrive economically as well as provide affordable food to people. And that's a two-edged sword. Uh, if uh, the cost of production are high, then the, the cost of food are high. We also must be, sh uh, and, and finally, environmentally, we have to reduce the harmful, harmful inputs that I talked about, but we also need to 
reduce energy use, soil erosion, uh, and um, minimize, overall, minimize the use of land and water because if we, um, the more land we use for agriculture, the less wild land we have. So as an organic farmer, I think that organic farming practices have something to contribute to uh, sustainable agriculture. One of the important things to remember is that when Sir Albert Howard uh, invented organic agriculture, he did it in response to essentially these same problems of conventional agriculture. So you could view organic agriculture as one strategy of solving those problems. This is a slide of uh, uh, the student farm a couple of years ago, and it provides an example of how organic agriculture uses fewer pesticides than conventional agricultural systems. And we do that through crop diversity, crop rotation, the support and enhancement of, of beneficial organisms. A key uh, to or organic farmers is the use of uh, resistant varieties and also naturally occurring and mostly low toxicity pesticides. <coughs> Basically, the, it's an integrated pest management uh, system that's used in organic agriculture. For nutrients, organic farmers do two main things. One, they use compost, and two, they use cover crops. The use of compost and manure, but particularly compost, is important because it recycles agricultural waste and urban green waste back to the farm. Uh, otherwise, both of those wastes can end up in, in, um, uh, and pollute land and water, or they can end up in the landfill. Uh, about 10 years ago, California banned uh, urban green waste from going into the landfill, and since then, uh, uh, the vast majority of it has been composted and returned uh, mostly to organic farms. The other key to organic nutrients are, are cover crops. They both build soil by adding organic matter. And um, these are legumes here. This is vetch and bell beans. And uh, they have a symbiotic relationship with a rhizobium bacteria that fix nitrogen out of the air, bring it into the plant. And when the plants are turned in, it adds nitrogen to the soil. So. Uh, even though this is a great system, it, uh, the, this, this crop on our farm fixes about 150 pounds of nitrogen a year, but, there's no, but, but it's not a free lunch in the sense that the, the, the cover crop needs time and space to grow, and all of that nitrogen isn't available all at once because it takes microbes to transform that uh, organic form of nitrogen into its mineralized form. But nevertheless, it's a way of providing nitrogen to plants and adding organic matter to the soil. And one of the big, big pluses of adding organic matter to the soil and also of having it in the organic form is that it reduces nitrogen leaching in this study from 50 to 80%. And that's certainly one of our goals in sustainable agriculture. Organic farming practices have also been shown to uh, reduce soil erosion. And it's obvious if that Iowa field that I showed you had been covered in a cover crop, then the impact of the rain would have been much, much less. And the soil erosion would have been much, much less. Um, these are cowpeas that we're growing at the student farm over the summer and keeping the soil covered and adding or, uh, organic matter, humus particles that uh, tie the soil together are key to, to uh, 
reducing erosion. So you might ask yourself after that, well, that solves the problem. But it doesn't quite solve the problem because there's some issues that need to be addressed in our, in, with organic agriculture. One is that there are some pests and diseases and stresses that are really difficult to control using organic methods. Uh, on our farm, we have uh, an infestation of symphylins, which, is, which are often associated with organic farms, and it's very challenging. We've tried a lot of different things. We can't control them. Symphylins are a little arthropod pests that eat root hairs. Very difficult to deal with. But there are also viruses that um, there aren't really controls for. And then, of course, there's uh, flooding and drought and frost tolerance and things that uh, uh, organic farming, per se, doesn't solve. There's also, if you do the numbers, and they're, 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 a, little, uh, they're a, a little challenging to do, but if you do the numbers, there's in, insufficient manure and green waste to provide all the nutrients for organic farming systems because this is an animal waste based uh, system and if you don't have the manure or other animal products to feed the plants you don't have much else. Uh, yields in organic it depends on the on, on the study I, I, I have a follow-up slide to show you are between 45 and 100 percent of conventional systems. And based on today's reality, it seems like a lot of organic products may be too expensive for low-income consumers. So there was a study in, in uh, 2012 that came out that looked at many of the, of the scientifically based peer-reviewed studies on comparisons between organic and conventional and found overall that yields of organic were 25 percent lower and it varied whether it was fruits or oil seeds or grains or vegetables but um, but the impact of that if we're thinking about producing for the world is significant secondly um, as I was saying organic agriculture requires manure for nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, etc. And a number of, uh, well, one expert uh, in, in particular did the back of the envelope uh, calculations and estimated the, the need for a billion more livestock in the U.S. to provide enough manure if you wanted to provide nutrients to all the farmland using organic methods. And I, um, I happened to, uh, to do those similar calculations for Nebraska, and you have about 7 million animal units here, uh, uh, cows and uh, sheep and pigs, uh, and that's enough manure for about half a million acres if you could collect it all. And, and, and there's a big challenge there because uh, if the animals are in the field, it's a challenge. And if, uh, even if they're in feedlots, you lose some to the atmosphere, you lose some to runoff. But presently, there are 77,000 organic acres out of a total uh, in the state of 19 million field crop acres. So, there's room for expansion um, in Nebraska, but there's not room for, there's not enough manure for all the state's cropland. So if you want to improve agriculture overall and have a more ecologically based agriculture, you can do some of it with organic agriculture, but you can't do all of it. So when I first saw this slide, I didn't know what it was. I couldn't get my head around what was happening here. And it, it, it turns out that this is a hillside in Ecuador that's being farmed. And it's really steep. It's really, really steep. And it's an example of 
if you, if you need more farmland, this is what you start to farm. And uh, farming here can't be good uh, for a number of reasons. So without, without additional yield increases, maintaining the, even maintaining the per capita food, uh, food consumption that we have now is estimated would require a doubling of the world's cropland. And the reason uh, people say a doubling is because the land, the new land that's brought in isn't going to be anywhere near as productive as the land we're farming now. So that's a, that's a summary of what I think organic farming can contribute to sustainable agriculture, but also some reasons why it can't do it all. Uh, Pam now is going to talk about the power of Im Im improved seed and the ability of modern genetic approaches to make contributions to sustainable agriculture. So I, th I thought I'd start out off here in, in Bali. So this farmer, as many farmers in the world, lose 30 to 60 percent of their yield to pests, disease, and environmental stress. And I wanted to give some examples, about four examples, that illustrate how modern genetic approaches can help address these challenges. For, so first, to remind those of you that are not plant pathologists, uh, that plants get diseases as humans do. And I love this image. It's a time-lapse video by Remco Stan at the University of Dundee. And it shows what a disease-causing organism can do within four days. And this uh, related pathogen uh, is very famous. 150 years ago, it destroyed the entire potato crop in Ireland and dramatically changed the course of history. Between 1845 and 1852, about one million people died and one million more emigrated from Ireland. Now this wasn't all tragedy because one of those emigrants was President Obama's great-great-great-grandfather. I guess it depends on your political persuasion, <laughs> whether that was good or bad. Um, so I wanted, my first story is, is papaya. So I want to give you an example of, of how a modern genetics has really helped pa papaya farmers in Hawaii. So this papaya is infected with a virus called papaya ring spot virus. And you could see these um, symptoms on the fruit. Now in the 1950s, uh, the entire papaya production was grown on the island of Oahu, essentially all the papaya produced on the west coast of the United States, all the papaya that we eat in California. However, it was decimated by papaya ring spot virus, and there was no way to control this disease. There was no conventional method, there was nothing you can spray, there was no organic method, there was no naturally occurring resistance. The farmers uh, were forced to abandon their orchards. So they moved to another island, and they moved to the island of Hawaii. And as plant pathologists knows, uh, because of, there's so much trade, that eventually the virus would be discovered in Hawaii. And indeed, in 1992, uh, the virus was discovered in Hawaii. And very quickly after that, it presented a great crisis for Hawaiian papaya farmers. 1995, the production plummeted. And by 1998, the papaya production had dropped to 26 million pounds. So the farmers were looking at um, the choice of simply abandoning the entire industry. Now, there is um, a hero to this story. This is Dennis Consalves. He's a local Hawaiian. And in 1978, Gonsalves became very interested in this modern genetic approach of genetic engineering. So he and his co-workers initiated research to develop strategies to control the viral disease. And they knew this it was a big problem in Hawaii. And as I said, it was predicted that the virus would eventually have a new outbreak. So what they did is they took a small snippet of DNA from a mild form of the virus, and they introduced it directly into the papaya genome using this modern approach of genetic engineering. So this is similar, although mechanistically different, to human vaccinations against polio or smallpox. And this treatment 
immunous papaya plant against further infection. And this slide is uh, an image from uh, Steve Ferrara and, and the group who worked with Dennis Gonzalez of a field trial in 1995. So what you see, it's an aerial view of a transgenic field that was started in October 1995. And the solid block of green papaya trees in the middle are their new genetically engineered papaya called rainbow. And the surrounding papaya trees are the conventional papaya. And you can see that they're virtually dead. Uh, these trees are all severely infected with papaya ring spot virus. And just to remind you, this is a naturally incurring infection. So you can imagine what the rest of the farmer's fields looked like in Hawaii. And at this time, it was really the early days of genetic engineering. This project was funded uh, entirely uh, by nonprofit sources, the, the USDA. And there was, it was very quick to do the field tests. I think the, the rules at that time was to place a, um, a fence around the field. Uh, so it was very, it was not costly to carry out the research, nor were the regulatory issues uh, quite a, a, a problem at that time. So what was the example? What was the result of that? And this shows you a graph from um, early to, uh, you can see in the 1950s, high levels of papaya production. And when the virus was introduced, you had this massive uh, drastic reduction in papaya. But the dark blue arrow shows the introduction of the transgenic papaya. And there was a rapid rebound in the industry. And today, virtually 90, 95% of all papaya in Hawaii is genetically engineered. And the papaya that we eat in California, probably what you eat here, is genetically engineered as well. And I love this story because it um, was for local farmers, many of them very poor, poor immigrant farmers that were growing papaya. It was a nonprofit uh, funded. And I really think it's an excellent example of appropriate technology because, of course, genetic engineering is not always the most appropriate technology. There are many other methods and many tools that farmers have. But in this case, it was very appropriate because there was no other method, as I mentioned, that was available to control the disease. And 20 years later, there's still no other method to control this disease. There are organic production in Hawaii still. Raul and I were fortunate to take a, a tour of some of the farms out there. And one local grower told us that he um, tried to grow some papaya organically. Because, because, of course, to be certified organic, maybe we forgot to mention this, to be certified organic, you cannot use modern genetic technology. You cannot use genetic engineering. Actually, you can use many genetic technologies, but not this specific technology of genetic engineering. So there's a great incentive for farmers in Hawaii to try to grow their crops organically because then they can sell it at much higher prices. At one, at one point uh, in Japan, uh, consumers there were paying 20 times higher for a, an organic papaya versus a genetically engineered papaya. So there's a lot of incentive to try to grow papaya organically. And so what many growers are doing, and this grower in particular we visited, he had a beautiful farm, but to grow the organic papaya, he, he cleared out some native rainforest because the idea is that the papaya had not been grown there, so the virus would not be there. So he cleared out a native rainforest, and we can talk about whether that's a sustainable approach or not. He planted his papaya, and he showed us in the very first year the papayas were infected. So this virus is, is still spreading. So he gave up, and he's no longer growing uh, papayas. So this is my second story. And this is an image of a bullworm hatching from its egg. Now, this is a very serious uh, pest. In fact, it's estimated that approximately 25% of all the world's insecticides are used to control this insect. The Environmental Protection Agency considers seven of the top 15 insecticides used on cotton in the United States as possible or known human carcinogens. So um, organic growers for a number of years have been using a compound called Bt. It's from a bacteria and spraying this compound on cotton plants to, to, to control this disease. 
And geneticists used um, engineered cotton to contain the same protein. And this was developed in the 1990s, and these genetically engineered cotton could protect themselves against insects. And Bt is really a favorite insecticide of organic farmers because it kills pests, but it's non-toxic to mammals, birds, fish, and humans. And this has been um, quite uh, embraced quite all over the world, and I wanted to just give you a few examples. In Arizona, growers cut their insecticide use in half while maintaining the same yield as their neighbors by, after they started planting Bt cotton. And insect, and you can, it's not hard to understand why they were able to in, increase insect biodiversity in the field because they're not spraying as many broad spectrum insecticides. So they're able to allow um, the growth of beneficial insects, and this was measured by the diversity of beetles and ants in the field, and this work is largely carried out by Bruce Tabashnik and his uh, collaborators at University of Arizona. Today, Bt corn and cotton is grown on a cumulative total of 200 million hectares worldwide, which is more than enough to cover the entire state of Texas, California, and Iowa. And in India, this has also been a very important uh, new variety. This is a cotton farmer in Gujarat, India. And studies have shown that yields increased 30 to 40 percent on small farm plots compared to neighboring plots that were growing conventional cottons. And as a result, farmers were using uh, 40 percent less insecticides. But there were also other effects, socioeconomic effects, that benefited the villagers. And this is a study by um, Kame and his college, colleagues. They looked at data from 375 farms in central and southern states over a period of five years, and they saw, on general, in general, there was a 135 hectare profit gain, which benefited the community in, in several different ways. China, too, has been growing Bt cotton for uh, quite a number of years now. And this is, a, is very important because China is the world's leading producer of cotton. They produce 6.7 million tons per year. And when they started planting uh, Bt cotton in 1997, they saw very quickly a massive reduction in insecticide use. Within four years, they had reduced the annual use of these insecticides by 156 million pounds. And that's about the same amount of insecticides that's sprayed in California every year. So this is just one trait that could have that large effect in reducing insecticides. There's also been studies showing that insecticide-related illnesses among farmers in the region dropped to a quarter of the previous level. And you have to remember that in less developed countries, there are often are not the safety equipment needed to spray the more toxic insecticides effectively, so farmers and their families often suffer. By 2001, Bt cotton accounted for nearly half the cotton produced in China. Okay, so again, you could say, well, okay, I've solved the insect problems, but it's, it's never that simple. BT technology does not control all insects. It controls a certain type of insects, inclu including uh, the bollworm. And it was found that within just a few years, China populations of other insects decrease. So the, the farmers quit spraying insecticides, everybody's happy, but then there's other types of insects that are beginning to increase, called myrids, that are not controlled by Bt. So the farmers start spraying other types of insecticides once again. So this, um, I really want to emphasize that seed technology is really just one element of an, of an overall effective strategy. We can't rely on seed alone to solve all of our problems. Um, and so farmers really need to integrate other strategies to manage the diverse spectrum of diseases and pests that attack the crop. And many of you farmers here probably have a lot of strategies. In Arizona, they use different types of um, beneficial insects that will prey on some of the more toxic insects in combination with the BT technology. So really, the, the key to the continued efficacy of using these types of 
Bt crops depends on increasing crop diversity and crop rotation and other integrated pest management strategies. So finally, I'd like to turn to some work, collaborative work from my lab. And so I work on rice, which is a staple food for more than half the world's people. Three quarters of the world's poorest people get their food and income by farming very small plots of rent land like rice. And so I, when I was a graduate student, actually, I was working on peppers and tomatoes, which are wonderful crops, very exciting to work on. But I decided at some point when I shifted to work on a postdoc that instead of working on salad, I'd start working on supper. Uh, and I was really intrigued with rice because it was very clear that small improvements to productivity can have a large and positive impact on lives of millions of poor farmers. So I um, have a time-lapse video here, which is actually in the wrong place, so I'm going to go back to that. And I want to just first talk about this project in collaboration with Dave McKill, the International Rice Research Institute. So this area that's been circled has a lot of flooding. And it's also where 25% uh, of the world's rice is grown. And as Raul showed earlier, uh, in Bangladesh, for example, there are massive floods. And each of the last four and five years, there's been really terrible flooding. Although rice likes to grow in water, if it's completely submerged, the rice plants will die. Most rice varieties will die after three days. So in a long time ago now, in about the 1950s, it was known that there was a very rare type of uh, rice variety, which is shown here in this region of India called uh, Orissa, that was highly tolerant to submergence. It had a really amazing property. It could stay underwater for two weeks, and then when the flood was removed, it could start to grow again. And so this clearly would have a huge benefit to farmers in this part of the world in South and Southeast Asia. So, um, oh, and I should just mention, since it's written on the bottom of the slide, in Bangladesh and India alone, 4 million tons of rice, which is enough to feed 30 million people, is lost every year to floods. So breeders, uh, since the 1980s, have been trying to use conventional methods to introduce this very important trait into varieties favored by farmers. But they dragged in, they were, they, essentially they were never able to produce varieties that were acceptable to the farmers. The farmers would reject the varieties, they didn't have um, the traits that they wanted. And that's because we, often when you're doing conventional breeding, you're doing it in a, in a somewhat blind manner. You don't know the genetics, so you're dragging in undesirable traits along with it. So my colleague Dave McKill, who at the time was at University of California, Davis, had mapped this unusual submergence tolerant trait to a region of the chromosome. And we thought that if we could isolate this gene, that we could use that genetic information to very precisely introduce this gene into varieties favored by farmers. And so we were able to do that. My, my team at UC Davis were able to isolate the gene using an approach that originally was a pioneered in humans. It's called map-based cloning where you find the gene on a particular chromosome and you sort of walk step by step until you can isolate the gene. And then the way we found out we had the right gene is we used genetic engineering. And this is really a classic approach. For those of you that aren't geneticists, this is really what all of us do every day. <laughs> um, we take uh, on the left a non, this is our control, a non-genetically engineered rice variety. But then we also introduce the candidate gene which we called sub-1A, into these two varieties. And the reason we thought this was a candidate is because it was associated genetically with this trait, and also we were able to show that it's rapidly upregulated upon submergence. So it had characteristics of the gene that we were looking for, but you don't really know until you introduce it into a variety. So we, we generated these lines, and before submergence, before we start uh, drowning them, they look pretty good. The control on the left and the two transgenic varieties look very nice. But after 16 days of submergence, you can see the conventional variety has very long, yellow, droopy leaves, but the, the genetically engineered varieties look very good. After seven, so then you remove the flood, 
And seven days after recovery, you can see that the conventional variety is dead and the genetically engineered varieties are surviving. So this was the key experiment that told us that this gene that we named sub-1A-1 is sufficient to confer submergence tolerant to highly intolerant varieties. And um, Dave then uh, decided to, now that we have this genetic information, so once you isolate a gene, you know exactly what the gene is, and you also have information about other genes in the region. Um, and I should mention, so from uh, one reason I feel this project was successful is because from the start, the work was guided by the needs of small, uh, smallholder farmers adapted to local circumstances and sustainable for the economy and the environment. And the key goal was really to make these neat seed varieties available to those that need it. So Dave then used another genetic approach called marker-assisted breeding to uh, introduce this gene into varieties that were favored by farmers in India and Bangladesh. And this is a nice example of just a field trial where he used marker-assisted breeding. And just by looking at this, this is a field that was flooded for 17 days, and then the flood was removed. And you can guess which one has the new gene. Uh, if you can just compare Samba, for example, versus Samba sub-1, you can see that the variety with the sub-1 gene have very, very nice yield. And in fact, in these field trials, he's seen about three-fold increase in yield. And now I'm going to go back to this movie. I love this movie because it shows the power of genetics and how it got in the wrong place. I have no idea, but that's what we managed to do. So this is a time-lapse video that was taken at the International Rice Research Institute. And I think it can really give you an idea of the effect, of the powerful effect of a single gene. So the planting the two varieties. So on the left is the new variety developed at the International Rice Research Institute, and the right is the conventional. Here comes a 17-day flood, and this shows you the recovery of the rice plants after the flood. And you could see the addition of essentially a single gene, or I should say a small genomic region for the geneticists in the audience, has this dramatic effect. And so this yellow now is, is the grain. And in these field trials, um, uh, Dave and his colleagues measured threefold increase in yield. So these were controlled field trials at the International Rice Research Institute. And the next step was to introduce this to farmers. And Dave McKill led four years of field trials. And we were fortunate enough as a team to visit farmers. And this is um, on top our farmers in India. On the left, you can see their variety called Swarna, which is a variety planted in, in very, very large regions of India and Bangladesh. And on the right is the Swarna sub-1 variety. And the farmers, over four years, were seeing a three to four-fold yield increase. And uh, there has been massive flooding every year when these experiments were carried out. So they were very good conditions for um, uh, testing this. So with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, this year, sub one rice has reached two million farmers. And we <laughs> were also <laughs> able to interview <laughs> some of the <laughs> farmers there. <laughs> She's speaking the local dialect of Arissa, and there was really a lot of enthusiasm, and it was really a fantastic experience for us to meet the farmers, hear their questions, hear their experiences, and they also got a chance to, to talk to us as well. And that was facilitated again by the International Rice Research Institute in a participatory breeding program. So you have molecular geneticists, plant physiologists, breeders, and farmers uh, have a chance to meet each other. So finally, this is a, another crop, herbicide tolerant crop. It's um, one of the major genetically engineered crops that you're probably, many of you are familiar with. And this is a crop that carries a gene conferring tolerance to the herbicide glyphosate, which is also called Roundup. And the excitement about this is that glyphosate is, is considered non-toxic by the Environmental Protection Agency and has, has um, displaced many of the more um, toxic herbicides. And so 
there's a nice paper that just came out recently of canola production in Western Canada from 1995 to 2006. So I should say this trade has been introduced into many crops. Um, and this is just an example of canola. So in 1995, weeds were controlled both by herbicides that you apply into the soil and um, also by spraying and by tillage. So you're tilling the soil a lot. So that's how the weeds were controlled. And, but by 2006, the tillage was mostly eliminated. And this is very important because if you reduce tillage, you reduce soil erosion, and you also reduce greenhouse gas emissions because your tractor's not passing over the field so many times. And there's some estimates that, you know, in one year, this is equivalent to removing 4 million cars from the road. This study found that, um, a significant use to less, less toxic herbicides with the environmental impact decreased by 53%. Um, and also, the farmers were exposed to much fewer toxic chemicals. And the quantity of active ingredient decreased as well. So in canola in Canada, this has been a fairly successful um, uh, approach. And farmers continue to use this uh, no-till strategy. But of course, as we said before, just a seed is, is never a complete panacea. Integrated management is needed. If you use a single herbicide over and over, you're going to select for weeds that are resistant to the herbicide. And we are seeing that. Um, we have been seeing this even before introduction of genetically engineered crops. Just any herbicide you spray over and over, you're going to have resistant weeds. In Canada, they've seen less of a problem because they have a three-year rotation. They're integrating different types of management strategies, and they're using different types of herbicides as well. So it's, it's really critical to control weeds, not to only rely simply on genetically engineered seed, but to use multiple herbicides, crop rotation, and still use um, somewhat uh, a bit of tilling. And Raul wanted me to mention this slide because there are um, more and more farmers that are, are trying to use the modern genetic technologies in combinations with some practices from organic farming. And this is an example from Matt Liebman, where he combines both organic farming practices and genetically engineered crops to achieve the goal of sustainability. So he has developed a system that includes compost, the use of legumes, and an expanded rotation, which includes alfalfa and wheat, as well as corn and soybean. And using this approach, he was able to reduce his herbicides by 82%, reduce nitrogen use by 74%, compared to conventionally grown genetically engineered corn and soybean. And his net returns were greater using this mixed system. And finally, I have to mention this, um, uh, safety. We do know that genetic engineering is a different technique. It's been used for 20 years, whereas we've had um, uh, what we can call primitive genetic alterations for 10,000 years. We've had uh, conventional methods for 100 years, genetic engineering for 20 years. So what is the difference between these? They all introduce changes in the genetics. Um, but the National Academy of Sciences and virtually every other um, uh, agency from all over the world have come to the same conclusion, which is the process of genetic engineering, precision breeding, and conventional breeding presents similar risks. And it's really important to consider that, uh, that each crop has to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. It doesn't make sense to say all GMOs are good or all GMOs are bad because it, it's, it's meaningless. You really need to consider the crop um, and the environment and the goal. What is the goal of that genetically engineered crop? There's been more than a billion acres of crops planted over the last 20 years, and there's still not been a single case of adverse health or environmental impacts. So for these reasons, uh, the scientific the consensus in the scientific community is there's no basis for ruling out genetic engineering as a tool for crop improvement. So what is the future of agriculture? So imagine uh, the world your children will live in 50 years from now if we don't make changes in agriculture. We know we will see continued environmental degradation, lack of food and water for many, and increased global conflicts over that food and water. And um, 
there are many components needed for sustainable food production, and seed is just one component, but it really is a very important com component. And I wanted to just um, remind you of the dramatic advancements in plant genetics, really over a very short time, 10, 15 years. This is a little mustard weed called Arabidopsis, and it has a very small genome, and it was the first plant genome sequence. It took seven years to get the complete sequence, $70 million, and 500 people. And at the time, a lot of people questioned the uh, worth worthiness of sequencing this little mustard, and uh, actually at the same time, people were questioning uh, whether it was worthwhile to sequence the human genome. It was very, it was truly very costly, and it truly did take um, a lot of funds from different kinds of research. But consider the situation today. Um, Next year, this year, it's expected the same project to take two to three minutes and cost $99. And it's not only the Rabidopsis genome we have. We have the corn genome. We have the rice genome. We have the banana genome. And banana is the fourth staple food in the world. It's the primary staple food for 100 million Africans. And we have soon the wheat genome. And now not only do we have a single genome, but we have multiple genomes of these different plant species. And that's important because every different variety has different genes with very important ag agronomic traits that breeders can use um, to enhance the sustainability of our farms. So it's a very, very exciting time in plant genetics for those of you that are students and are interested in pursuing a career. So I believe that um, it would be foolish really not to take advantage of the advances in plant genetics and to use this knowledge for public good. We believe that the judicious incorporation of two important strands of agriculture, agricultural biotechnology and agroecology, really are key to help feed the growing population in an ecologically balanced manner. Agriculture really needs our collective help and all appropriate, appropriate tools we feel very strongly that pitting genetic engineering and organic farming against each other only prevents the transformative changes that we need on our farms. And there really seems to be a communication gap between organic and conventional farmers and between consumers and scientists. And the stakes are very high in closing that gap. Without good science and good farming, we cannot even begin to dream about establishing an ecologically based biologically based system of farming and ensuring food security. So um, to conclude, we need everybody at the table. We really appreciate you all coming today. We have the know-how, the tools, and the resources to create crops for the millions that need them. And to accomplish this, uh, we need uh, your continued help. So uh, thank you very much, and we're happy to take questions. So we, we have microphones both in the upper deck and on the floor here, so Jill and Betty have those mics. So if you have a question, please get the mic so it'll come across on the web stream. There's one here on the floor. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, my question is actually to you, Raul. Um, you presented organic agriculture and manure uh, as lacking. However, what you really covered, what it seemed to me was annual crops and not incorporating perennials and the importance of uh, increasing the biomass and photosynthesis needed to create um, the compost needed, not just the animals and the manure, but uh, also the foliage that we could use as well um, in organic agriculture system. I think. Um, I guess I have a few statements more than more than questions and you can kind of take it um, I think part of it is continuing with the same way that we're doing agriculture that is continuing our staple crops of of rice and corn and soy and a few of these things versus maybe transforming the way we look at food as a whole and maybe going towards more of a perennial based system uh, that will incorporate more of an ecological system um, that will help aggradation and not degradation of our soils. Um, 
Uh, I have a lot of things I want to share, but I, I was wondering maybe if you could just touch on that a little bit, um, uh, yeah. or just maybe the local, the local system of incorporating animals into the whole system versus we need more animals so that we can distribute the manure across the U.S. versus how we cre create the manure on the farm to right. be more of a holistic yeah. so local the, system. So there are two issues there that are important. Um, one is uh, perennials, of course, need nutrients too. Uh, and and uh, transporting those nutrients is actually uh, a big challenge if you just want to use organic sources. So what, there's, a, there's a, uh, a report that I found that the USDA did where they looked at uh, manure sources in the U.S. versus crop fields uh, in the U.S. And the, uh, the challenge of getting the manure from the sources to the crop fields as it exists now is, is a big one and, and expensive one. And whether the crop field is a perennial or a annual, those plants still need nitrogen, they still need phosphorus, they still need potassium, they still need all those, all those nutrients. And uh, I, uh, the other question you had. Uh, it was more about putting the animals on animals. the Animals, oh, say, so, so that, was the, that was the original vision of Sir Albert Howard, that the animals are on the farm and as much as possible they provide the nutrients in a, in a cyclic system uh, to the plants. Uh, for much of the U.S., we've gotten away from that system uh, for a variety of reasons and, and returning it to a system where animals are on the farm is certainly a positive thing to do. Uh, but what that would mean, if, even if you just do the numbers, is that you'd need a lot more animals on a lot more farms. And uh, if, if uh, the, um, the mantra of organic farmers really should be eat more meat because you need the animals in order to provide nutrients for the plants. The, um, the Chinese uh, 40 centuries ago had a solution for this and they were returning human waste back to the farms. There you go, human waste back to the farms. And that really is the, the complete cycle, the balanced system. And it doesn't seem like the U.S. or anyone in the world is anywhere close to making that a reality. It's prohibited, right? Organic, in well, organic right farming. Right now, it's prohibited in organic farming to use human waste. Um, so there are other solutions, but they're challenging ones. And a lot of it has to do with you know, transportation. The other thing is, of course, is that if you want more animals, you have to feed them. So you actually have to allocate more land to feeding animals instead of feeding people. So there's a balance there, and, and I don't think there are any easy answers. But uh, it just seems like um, animals alone and green waste and other organic sources aren't going to provide nutrients for all the acres that, that we have there's available. there's a question right here in the back. Um, I have two questions. What are some exciting developments in food genetics over the next 20 years? And then the other one was, because of the lower yields, why is organic farming not a regressive tax on lower income people? I couldn't quite I, hear that. You might want to repeat the last one. I couldn't hear it. Um, due to the lower yields, why is organic farming not a regressive tax on lower income individuals? A regressive tax? Well, I, um, I don't know if I can answer that, but in a way, uh, organic food these days is being purchased largely by affluent people. Um, and and I, it's... Uh, uh, low-income people, for the most part, unless they're very ideologically motivated, would have a hard time paying that much for foods that they could get for uh, significantly less. What are the 
next 20 years genetics of food. Oh, okay. What would you predict? And so the next 20 years, there's a lot of people working on viral, um, different types of viral resistant crops. So it's act genetic engineering for viral resistance is really very promising. There's many viral diseases that there's just no way to control these diseases. And it's, it's kind of conceptually un easy to understand, especially some of you maybe had the flu recently. It's not very fun. Uh, viral diseases are very diff difficult to combat. Um, using standard methods. So there's a lot of groups around the world um, developing viral resistant uh, crops. So there's a plum that was just released, um, USDA certified that is resistant to um, a, a serious viral disease. A really big effort in many, many parts of the world is drought tolerance. Um, partly because of the global climate change, we're seeing massive droughts around the world. Also because of the advances in plant genetics, we know so much more about the molecular mechanisms underlying drought to tolerance that there are um, crops, uh, several I think, on the verge of being released, and um, those are going to be very important. We also, we didn't have time to talk about golden rice, which is a really important and exciting project. This was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation for many years. There are millions of children around the world that are, have vitamin A deficiency and that leads to very serious diseases such as, as diarrhea and blindness. It's estimated that 500,000 children um, go blind every year because of lack of vitamin A and um, half of those will die. So there is a, uh, a golden rice that's been developed which has enhanced vitamin A content. Uh, it's uh, expected to be released uh, as soon as next year. Probably the Philippines is the first place it will be released. And the predictions, conservative predictions published in high-level journals such as Nature are predicting that within the first year, the lives of 4,000 children will be saved. And I think that's also a very um, exciting example, and, and I hope people pay attention to that. It's one of the things that we don't we don't pay attention to here in the United States. We give our children vitamin D, fortified milk, iron fortified bread. We give them vitamins. We, it, it's just we don't have those deficiencies. They're not very, very common in most communities, but in the less developed world, they're, they're really, really critical. And um, it's been 50 years of trying to deliver vitamin supplements to these communities, trying to enhance cultivation of leafy greens and carrots, but they're still uh, millions of children dying. So the idea is that if you have a fortified rice and they, they're eating in these communities rice three times a day, you can really have a big impact. So there's going to be quite a diverse number of uh, uh, types of species, uh, crops that we're going to see out there. I think, Betty, you have one up top. Or looks like several up tops. Hi. Um, so you talked about how crop diversity is really important, like in that example from the farm at UC Davis, um, and maybe some of the problems with monocultures. It, it seems to me that that doesn't translate very easily to large-scale corporate farms. Um, and so I'm thinking about eating locally um, and small-scale um, local farms. What role does that play, or does that have a place in a model of sustainability um, for food? You know, I think there's always a place in a food sustainability model for local food. Um, local food is great because it cuts down on transportation costs. It's fresher. You know who's growing it. Uh, I don't think local food will, will ever go away. I, I think there's going to be more and more of it, in fact. Um, but I do also think that if you want to impact agriculture overall to make improvements in, in pesticide use and nitrogen runoff and soil erosion, you have to have a sustainability program for the larger growers as well. I, I was talking to a grower here, I don't know if I can find him, who they grow a diverse number of crops on the farm. They have about a, uh, I'm not exactly sure, about a 3,500 acre farm. They grow diverse crops. They have animals on the farm. They have rotations, they have biodiversity. And I think it can work on any scale, uh, but the grower has to make a commitment to, to uh, developing a more sustainable agriculture. 
And, and maybe just add to that that local food security is, is very important in places like Africa yes. where there aren't roads and if, if your crop dies, wh where are you going to get the food? And so there's a big effort for um, providing technologies to um, those farmers that, you know, they can't get food otherwise, so they have to produce the food themselves. And then you have to consider the mega cities that are developing in China and India. I mean, 20 million people living in just tiny, tiny amounts of land. And really the only way that they're gonna eat is if there's massive farms outside the cities and food is brought into the cities. So you really need to have this balance, I think, of very large farms delivering to these enormous cities. Um, and, and then, you know, have a husband that's a farmer that can bring you home your food every day, that's nice too. There you go. Yeah. So Betty, I think Sally McKenzie had one back here, or two more up there, and then one down. Hi. Um, I just had a question about um, how f genetically engineered organisms and the patents that are put on them are going to, I mean, we've seen some issues with Monsanto and other corporations that use the Roundup Ready seed, and, and then when they go and pollinate other farms that haven't paid for that patent, then they get into legal, um, trouble with that. So what kind of uh, legal issues can genetically more modified organisms bring about? Well, I think um, anytime you have a seed industry in the United States, we have had um, primarily all the seed almost in, in the U.S. is, um, okay, not all the seed, but a large part of the seed is hybrid seed production from very large corporations, farmers, um, are buying the seed, organic farmers buy the seed, uh, those are all patented uh, lines. And when you have genetically engineered seed, the genes are also patented. So it's really, it's really the same issues, they're really important issues. Um, I'm not sure that the advent of genetic engineering has shifted um, how we need to look at that, but I think it is important to have, to, con to continue to have a diversified seed industry that you don't just have a few seed industries that have all the varieties and everything patented. And when you think of less developed world, um, you often, at least to date, I mean, things are changing so rapidly, but for example, uh, the rice that we developed and we've introduced a, a new gene um, that's distributed through local uh, certified agencies. There's no patent on the gene. Um, and, and the industry, corporate, American corporations aren't so interested at the time in that, in those seeds anyway, because these are people that are subsistence farmers. So they're growing the seed, they're selfing the seed, they're replanting the seed. And so um, I think it's important to separate these issues. So this issues of patents and who owns the seed is really important, but I think it has to be separated from the uh, technology of genetic engineering because um, Genetic engineering is, is used for lots of different purposes. If it, uh, one more comment. If it wasn't clear um, in what Pam said, seed companies these days are not only patenting genetically engineered seeds, they're patenting uh, um, uh, traditionally bred seeds as well, especially the parent lines of their hybrids. So the issue is, is much broader than just genetic engineering, it's really an issue of the, the, the seed industry and, and what role patenting plays in our whole crop system. And, and, and it's a really challenging one because if, if um, seed diversity is reduced because of this, I don't think that the growers or the consumer benefit. And so uh, I'd like to see much more diversity in the seed industry, uh, less consolidation, less buying up of companies. Uh, I think that's in our long-term benefit. So we're going to take two more questions, one up, up top here, and then Jill has one down below, and then we'll let people visit with uh, the guests afterwards. Sally. So first, I just want to thank you. This is a huge service you're doing for the community, certainly for the scientific community, just doing these thank talks. You. Um, so my question to you is with regard to the hypervirulent negativity and really scare tactics associated with uh, GM technologies, who, who benefits from that scare technology or that, that scare 
uh, effort. And what do you think actually motivates that now? I mean, I think you've made a good presentation. It, it's, not, it's not science. It's not an issue of science. It's, it's something else. And it isn't even so simple as being just a social issue. So I'm just, I'd like to hear your comments on where you think the negativity comes from, and as well the, the efforts toward misinformation, which I know you're trying to address here. Well, of course, that's a difficult, uh, important question, difficult uh, to answer, and I think, you know, it's different in every, every location. Um, so we just had this ballot initiative in California to label um, Prop 37. So in California, you can put um, whatever you want on a, to the voters and you get enough people to sign it. And this particular ballot initiative was very controversial. It was, most people felt it was poorly written, whether they were for it or against it, but basically it had, you know, kind of the skull and crossbones, GMO had to be put on, well, virtually all the food, any processed food now it has, labeled. it had to be labeled. And it was defeated. Um, and so the support for that came from a, a vitamin, salesman who had been uh, reprimanded and perhaps even indicted a couple of times by the FDA for false information. And he is a millionaire and he, he I, I guess, stands to profit from this type of fear mongering. So there is that really sadly cynical situation. And unfortunately, I think the organic industry, it, it came out of such really important um, important goals, a response to the overuse of certain pesticides and herbicides. But unfortunately, it's now a lot of it is all about marketing as well. So the organic industry hopes to profit. So if the, if the public thinks that there's something scary uh, or environmentally problematic with genetic engineering or that if it's really different, of course, from a scientific point of view, it's, genetic engineering is not really that different than um, mutagenesis or other types of genetic alterations, well then it's hoping that then they can um, profit in that way. So there's, I think my impression now is that it's almost purely market driven, this, this virulence. But, but there's also <laughs> issues um, in Europe, there was the outbreak of mad cow disease, which disturbed consumers because scientists in Europe had assured consumers for years that, that uh, mad cow disease wasn't an issue, wasn't going to get into the food supply, uh, and it wasn't dangerous, but, but it was. And, you know, people died. And I think that really, uh, that really caused a lot of concern in Europe uh, and has led to further concern about genetic engineering safety of the food supply. Yeah. It's like vaccines. <laughs> we also see, we had this um, tremendous, I don't know if it affected you here, but in California there were communities, one of the wealthiest communities in the entire United States, uh, in Marin County. Many parents quit vaccinating their children because they heard on TV a movie actress and a uh, uh, a medical guy named Andrew Wakefield said that the vaccines are what causing autism. Many, many parents, highly educated, highly wealthy, they quit vaccinating their children. And uh, two years ago, they had the largest whooping cough outbreak in the entire nation. And so they had, health workers had to go back into that community and actually re-educate them as to why we vaccinate our children and that, you know, the link is um, never been proven. Um, and so I think it's, it's very, very similar with genetically engineered crops, the same kinds of communities that have this sort of fear. And I mean, we all love our children, and so you, you, you worry. Um, and we, we do have some characters like Andrew Wakefield and that actress in the um, this topics about genetic engineering. So we have one last question, but for, to, before you ask that, one of the things we were talking about at lunch today with, with Pamela and Raul was uh, many of you will have read recently about Mark Linus in the UK who had been a very strong advocate against GMOs who recently recanted that uh, and said that he was wrong. He had discovered science 
and that this was the promise for the future instead. And we were talking a little bit at lunch today about what will the reaction to that be in the long term to, to see where that goes. So the last question down here on the floor. Uh, Raul, I think this question is for you. It's about, um, pes uh, not pesticides, but fertilizers. It's my understanding that there, the, of the pesticides that we mine out of the ground, like potash, that there are limited amounts of those. Yeah, you know, phosphorus. And, and phosphorus yeah, as well. Phosphorus is a big so one. my question is, you know, if, if uh, they don't just bleed out of the ground, um, what, it, it, don't you see in the future conventional farming going to manure anyway? And <laughs> would, I mean, do, is you know that we, isn't that the, um, inevitable? The, the, uh, it's been fascinating to me. There was a lot of talk about the, the end of peak oil and how we were going to run out of oil. And like five years later, we've got more natural gas than we know what to do with. But the real issue might be the end of phosphorus, that mining phosphorus, the, the areas around the world that have phosphorus are being mined out. And w within a relatively short amount of time, we're going to need some other phosphorus source. And it's a really good question where it's going to come from. We don't know. We don't know. There, there's, there's not enough manure. Uh, and uh, we might be um, um, mining phosphorus out of landfills. You know, I, I just don't, don't know, but, but it's, a, yeah, it's a good long-term question that's not being addressed yet. Yeah, and again, you need many different ways to work at this, and there are genetic, geneticists working to try to enhance phosphate assimilation and nitrogen assimilation um, to, to use it more efficiently. Well, please join me in thanking Pamela and Raul for a very interesting